Uh, anyway, thank you very much uh, as organizers uh, for uh, inviting us to come here to uh, speak at your annual energy conference. Uh, and thank you also, Herr Emma, for the timely announcement this week uh, that um, uh, really uh, inspired me to uh, make sure we are well prepared for our entry into the Greek market. Um, and um, uh, it works. So I will talk about floating offshore wind, but I know also in, in, the, in the Greek uh, context of renewables, offshore wind is a new sought after uh, power supply. Uh, I was actually here in 2014 to figure out if it was time to get started, and I went home saying no. It wasn't because of the lack of wind, but it was that the legal uh, settings were not in place yet. And I can see now that there has happened a lot over the last few years, and uh, I think there will happen even more in the next several months. And this is very uh, exciting time to be here. But to put it in context a little bit, Offshore wind has been around since the 90s as a power supply. And it was really set up in five countries up until only a few years ago. And those are all have coastline to the southern part of the North Sea, where you have two qualities. You have a shallow water and you have a good wind resource. And that's where the industry has gone from being novel to become an industrialized industry with uh, a uh, LCOE that has come down radically, at least until uh, the last few months where we have seen some dent because of inflationary pressures. But I see that as really a dent because there's a tremendous amount of new countries. And for every time we read in the news about delays in the UK or in the US, there are other countries like Poland and Taiwan and Japan moving forward rapidly. So uh, the industry has gone from five countries in the northern Europe to become a global industry. And, and that will especially uh, uh, happen in what we do at Hexagon, which is floating wind only. So uh, um, my background is not in the wind industry. I've, I mean, I've been working for Hexagon for 10 years. But I am, have a maritime background. So everything that comes on the water, I've been working with. And when offshore wind started happening, we were just waiting for it to be floating. And actually, the founders of the company, they were inspired by the first floating turbine that went into operation in 2009. And uh, that was a test turbine. It is still in operation. And there's about 20 turbines in operation. All are test turbines, and they all are operating. So it's still a market which is very novel and being tested. And, uh, uh, but there are a lot of commercial uh, players who are developing large-scale wind farms in several countries for deep waters. 80% uh, actually of all water that belongs to nations on the globe are deeper than 60 meters water depth. And monopile wind farms or jacket wind farms are built today up to 50 to 60 meters, but not more. They might extend it somewhat, but the cost of bottom fixed goes up exponentially with water depth. I think the average water depth is like 25, 30 meters. So uh, already at 50 meters, uh, you can see that floating wind will make sense. And the, as the cost curve is coming down on floaters, it will go down on water depth also to compete with the monopiles. But that's a later stage. The, uh, uh, the growth is by most forecasters seen as being very, very strong. And there are very many countries, in addition to Greece, that are updating the legislation and putting in place auction systems uh, actually, in 2014, I said I didn't come back to Greece, but uh, we did set up in Spain then because they were actually working on the legislation. It's just that they're still working on it, and now you're doing things here. So, uh, good reason to come back. Uh, but 
you could say that there are uh, developments ongoing, not only in, uh, in the North Sea, also in the Baltic Sea, with Poland having 10 new wind farms being announced. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, Germany had a big auction in June where uh, companies paid billions of dollars to get hold of those water rights for merchant price. And uh, uh, that was, of course, the big oil majors, BP and uh, Total, that took home those uh, concessions. And um, uh, we see also in Asia, which has not come as far as Europe when it comes to renewable energy, that they are all actively pursuing uh, offshore wind and floating wind. And actually, 50% of new installations this year is in China of the global capacity increase. So who are Hexicon? Well, we're Swedish-based. I said the company was formed in 2009. Uh, it was formed by three uh, 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 naval persons from the maritime industry, trying to do something that, uh, inspired by the first turbine, but saying, why can't you only have one turbine on, on an expensive floater? Let's see if we can have two turbines on the floater to gain some efficiency. So that's pretty much why it looks like this. Uh, this is uh, how we illustrate our first wind farm with our own technology, and I'll come back to that later. But I'll show you here the principle is pretty much how you can have two turbines so close to each other is because it weather vanes passively around the mooring system. So the third corner is the mooring system with a turret, and a turret is something that the oil and gas industry has used for decades. So it's really using oil and gas technology and components in a new adaption. But it is patented for, for use in, uh, in offshore wind. So with weather vanes, when new wind direction comes in, it's usually calm before and, or it closed down, and you start one turbine, and it weather vanes automatically in line with the wind coming in side by, so that it hits the turbines that are side by side. Uh, so, why do we then think it is smarter to have two turbines than one? It's more complex, that's for sure. It's more expensive to demonstrate because you have a bigger piece of equipment. But it's really down to this picture, how you get power density. You want your footprint of the wind farm to be as small as possible. And with, uh, 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 without increasing the wake effect or the block effect. And, and by having lesser installations but more turbines, you get actually a lower LCOE and you also save on the expensive subsea cables and uh, all that. I can talk hours about, but I'm not here to sell you the technology. I'm just going to illustrate this is how we were born as a company. And uh, I can proudly say though that with this technology, we actually won the first floating wind auction in the UK last year. So um, we will have the first uh, uh, demonstration wind farm of two units and four turbines that actually has a, a feed-in tariff, a 15-year uh, feed-in tariff that the UK state provides. Uh, uh, so what we have done in parallel, because uh, when, you when you're developing technology that only costs money, you need to fund yourself. We have started developing uh, wind farm areas in different countries. And we have today a portfolio of, wind of seabed areas that we are developing in several countries. Uh, and I'll come back to that a little bit later, but it sums up to big numbers, and that's because wind farms at sea need to be big. They need to be big to pay for infrastructure, like the cables and the substations. But it needs also to be big, because uh, the sea area, uh, you get scale economies by building big wind farms. And we want to get the cost down. So our business model has two legs. It's easier to walk with two legs than one. And the two legs are the technology development, providing technology. And the, what we've done since a few years back is to develop a portfolio of projects. And those are, uh, uh, um, uh, I'll get back to where they are located. 
but uh, what I can say is that we, have, we, went, we went public in the Swedish stock market in 21, and we had made them promises to the, stock, to the shareholders that we would be in 25, uh, we will have uh, uh, not only be uh, profitable, but also have a verifiable technology and also have uh, projects on several continents. Uh, you see on the uh, timeline in the bottom there that we are actually uh, going, we are still investing in new countries, that's why I'm here. But we are also uh, uh, starting divestment of certain acreage, which is selling out or farming out to partners. We have done that before, and we will accelerate that during this year. Uh, and uh, that's how we will be money-making before we start getting revenue on the technology. As you might recognize in any energy projects, uh, you will have a long uh, development curve from initiating a project to construction start and installation and operation. And we are very active in the early stage. That's where we focus. We don't see ourselves being a competitor to any of the power companies in the room. We are complementary. So we only do the initiation and early stage and then we hand over to our partner. Uh, so it's pretty much we start on our own or we, or we start in a country with a partner such as in Greece with Hexagon Power being a joint venture. So we have 50 to 100 percent of the project when we start and we are down to 10 to 20 percent by the time construction starts or before construction starts and then down to zero. So we will never produce power ourselves. We are a designer and originator of seabed for wind farm uh, deployment. So where are we then? Well, um, we have um, actually the, the only country in the world that we know of that incentivizes the uh, industry to go further offshore is in Korea. Uh, and uh, in Korea, they have had for many years trying to get the stakeholders to compromise and it's not worked out so well for nearshore development. So they decided to give you a, a, certi a renewable certificate multiplier the further offshore you are and the deeper the water is because it's more expensive. And there there are uh, several international companies that teamed up with uh, Korean companies and are partnering for building the largest wind farms in the world. We partnered up with Shell, which is a major global energy player. And uh, together with them, we are developing the largest floating wind farm and have the first commercial order for uh, uh, 15 megawatt turbines, 84 turbines, that was ordered uh, almost a year ago. So it's quite a, a large uh, 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 exercise and a learning both for Shell and us on how to pursue this both in Korea and other places. In 2020, we had, we had a site for demonstrating we didn't use and we sold 90% to CIP, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, where we own still 10% and it's called Pentland and they will bid for the auction in 24 next year. It has all the grid agreements in place and all the consent ready. And in Sweden, we teamed up with Mainstream in a joint venture. We're developing uh, four sites of which three we have filed EIAs this year for large scale wind farms. Uh, and we are in other countries. In the Mediterranean, we have the uh, biggest operation right now in Italy, but it's not that far away from here. So we see that there are some synergies, of course, being involved in neighboring country to Greek, Greece. <laughs> but to put it in perspective, it's a very novel industry. And I know I'm over time, but only one minute. So I will finish off by saying that uh, the last... Uh, 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 the next six months, there will be over a thousand new turbines installed offshore. Of those thousand turbines, which will, you know, they will all be on monopiles, but 14. 14 will be floating. But 14 new turbines in six months in floating industry is way more than the previous six months, and much more than last year. So it is a tremendous growth rate from a small base, 
and it will continue for the years to come. And we'd love to see Greece to be one of the early commercial countries coming into the deep waters. Thank you very much.